our study of the book of John, and I just want to prep us with kind of looking back at last week, and for those of you who weren't here, let me just say it this way, that our point last week was that God can even use those who oppose him to bring about his purpose, and we discussed, as we'll look a little bit today, when Caiaphas said that it's better for one man to die that all should live, which is really the essence of the gospel, but he thought it was his will. And today I want to look at this. So if God can even use those who oppose him to bring about his will, to bring about his glory, I want you guys to listen through this message today as we continue in our study and just think this, and we'll revisit at the end, then how much more can God do for those of us who fully submit to him? That's my, just want you to think about that. If he can do through those who oppose him still have his will done, to have his name be glorified, how much more then can he do through those of us who fully submit to him. So let me just give you a background on this. I've already hinted at it, but Jesus had um, this opportunity in his life where he went to Bethany, and Bethany was outside of Jerusalem for about two miles, and his friends lived there, Lazarus and Mary and Martha, and the opportunity was to create this amazing miracle for God's benefit, and it was this amazing um, culmination of this movement we see in John of Jesus kind of moving through in these conflicts with all the religious leaders, and it comes this culmination really when his best friend, one of his, I shouldn't say that, one of his really good friends, Lazarus, he dies. Jesus waits around, he goes back to Bethany, um, and in front of all of these people who had been assembled there for that funeral, which would have been, apparently Lazarus was a very popular man because John makes it very clear in his gospel that many people from Jerusalem were there, and very publicly, Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. Some of these individuals rush back to Jerusalem, and they tell the religious leaders, what Jesus had done. And their thought process is that Jesus, man, he is a threat to their position, to their power. And so they, conv- they uh, call this meeting of what would be their Supreme Court, the Sanhedrin. And in there, they say this. They say, man, we've got to do something because our entire power structure, our position is only granted us by Rome because we can control the people. But if the people begin to follow Jesus, Rome will have no need for us. And so what then will they do with us? Well, they'll destroy us. And so in turn, before they do that, well, we have to kill Jesus. And that was the end of that. So I just want to prep this morning or afternoon and go with John eleven fifty four 54 through 57. And without my light, I won't be able to read. So here we go. Therefore, Jesus no longer moved about publicly among the people of Judea. Instead, he withdrew to a region near the wilderness to a village called Ephraim, Ephraim where he stayed with his disciples. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, many went up from the country to Jerusalem for their ceremonial cleansing before the Passover. They kept looking for Jesus, and as they stood in the temple courts, they asked one another, what do you think? Will he? What do you think? Isn't he coming to the festival at all? But the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that anyone who found out where Jesus was should report him so they might arrest him. So that brings us up to where we are today. So it's basically six days um, before the Passover, the completion of the fat Passover week, and Jesus goes back to Bethany. He's, he, after the uh, culmination of this event where he rose Lazarus from the dead, it says, he withdrew. He knows they're trying to kill him, and he withdraws because it's not yet his time. But in six days before the Passover feast, Jesus and his disciples, they return to Bethany, and they're visiting with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. What's interesting is that Matthew and Mark, they actually refer to this home that Jesus stays at as the home of Simon the leper. In these four gospel accounts, Matthew and Mark, they say this is the home of Simon the leper. A lot of the things that um, happened Well, we just aren't privy to every single detail. And so some scholars believe that Simon the leper was probably a famous, famous, a family member of Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. And some scholars would even contend, well, that he had been perhaps their father, which would certainly account for how they came to follow Jesus if he had healed their father. But either way, either way, they're in the home visiting and they're staying there as Jesus prepares for what we know was going to be the last week before his crucifixion before he heads into Jerusalem in that final week where he goes to the cross. And so again, I'll turn around because I can't read without this light. I'm going to go John 12, 2 through 8. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. 
Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard and expensive perfume she poured on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. All right, so we're just going to kind of bust through this thing, and this is what we're going to look at today is just this event. So what's happening here? There's so much stuff that's happening. Everything needs to be unpacked. I won't get to all of it, but the first is we're just going to start off with this perfume. This nard is expensive, and it comes from this plant that can only be found in northern India, or as I was told, and again, I can only trust my resources, in the Himalayas, which made it very valuable, highly sought after. It came from the spike nard plant. It's much like the essential oils that we have around us today. You see, it had many purposes. The Romans believed it had medicinal purposes, and so they actually used it for that. And it had this earth, it still does, I guess, it's still around, it has an earthy, musky smell, I've been told. And I've been told that like these essential oils, it clings to the hair and it clings to the skin. And as a perfume, it was considered in those days to be the very best of the best. If you wanted the best, man, this was the sign of opulence, of wealth, of extravagance, was to have pure nard perfume. So much so that it was also used within the temple as an incense offering to God by the priests in the temple. Also, and this is kind of cool, in the Song of Solomon, and for those of you who don't know the Song of Solomon that much, and you've got to be like, I think, 13 years old as a Jewish male to read it because it is so scandalous. It says such things, and I'm sorry for you children here to have to hear this, but things like, your neck is like a tower. No, I know, pretty provocative, right? Scandalous, but it's in there, right? But this is a story of um, Solomon and his bride, and this is a love story between them. And it says in there, in Solomon, it says that while my beloved, this is his bride, while my beloved was at his table, my perfume gave forth its fragrance. And that actual perfume was nard. It's this beautiful, lovely thing in this Song of Solomon that above everything else that stood out, the finest of the finest was that she had and was offering to her groom. And so it was often used in the first century in Israel Nard, if you had some, was used to bless the marriage bed. In fact, uh, maybe, maybe this had even been given to Ma uh, Mary in such a way that it was a gift from her parents for just such a future occasion. But again, either way, while Martha's preparing supper, Mary goes and gets this bottle of perfume. And here's what's crazy. In today's, if you're just looking at kind of how much would this bottle of perfume be worth in today's times, not what you could get the bottle for now, but if you convert what they had a year's way, it's around $31,000. Imagine, just let that sink in for a minute. A $30,000 bottle of perfume she brings out. She brings this thing out, and she approaches Jesus, and she begins to pour it over his head. You see, this is the other thing. Uh, again, Matthew and Mark both record that that's exactly what she did, that she began to pour it over his head, and we think, well, is this John wrong? No. John didn't say that she didn't pour it over his head. John simply says he's focusing on what's going on at the feet. He doesn't say she didn't. He just says that Mary, he pours it. She pours it over his head, and she begins to wash his feet with her hair with this oil, which means that this was enough. Imagine this. This was enough in that bottle to flow out and to pour into his hair and start going down his skin, and she got the excess, and she used her hair, and she began to, to wash Jesus' feet with this $31,000 bottle of perfume. And I say all this because I want you to get how uncomfortable you and I would have been had we been in the room. I want you guys to think about that. Because so often, in fact, in a couple weeks, we're going to talk about Judas, and he's introduced here for pretty much the first time, and we're going to talk about him in a way that I want you guys to be open to, and I want you to understand that real people in these events, real people witnessing these things, their reaction, I've said for a long time, if I was in the first century, what group would I have been most comfortable hanging out with was probably the Pharisees to know who's in and who's out by what they're doing and how they're doing it. I'm probably going to be the guy going, wait a minute, are you kidding me? 
in this group right now because all the disciples were there. Matthew and Mark say all of the disciples were put out by this thing. All of them were looking, and I would have had the same reaction, going, we're having to pick the heads off wheat to stay, to stay full. We're having to sleep on the ground. We don't even have, you had to get a coin to make a point, and she's got $31,000, and she's wasted all of it? She poured it all over you. I say that because I want you guys to get that this was indeed an extravagant, extravagant. In fact, I would say it was shockingly extravagant. But John records Judas as the one who gave voice to what the other gospel accounts say they were all feeling when he says, well, we could have sold that. We could have sold that to help poor people. And, and I can say this, and this is, this is absolute. Uh, you read through John, and you read through Matthew, and you read through the other gospel accounts. I'll say this. John was still angry with Judas. I want you to get that. Sixty years later, Ju John was the one, as you read through Matthew and Mark, they say some other things. They give kind of this different description, not a counter description. They just don't go in as in-depth with, with this man. I'll just say, and we'll talk about it later, John, he was still one who absolutely, absolutely still remembers how Judas, this person they lived with for three years, he betrayed Jesus. But again, we'll talk about Judas in a few weeks, but I will say this, and this is for then, but I want you guys to consider it now also, because Judas and his reaction and Mary's reaction plays a huge role part in this as we contrast the two. So I'll just say this because Judas is introduced for the first time here, and I'll say this. Judas followed Jesus, but he never fully submitted to Jesus. And I want you guys to think about that as we go into the next couple weeks, or even right now. I want you to think about the difference, that Judas followed Jesus, that he had been there for all these other things. He followed him, but he never fully submitted and the consequences of that, as we're going to see, man, it's tragic. And it's a dangerous thing for any of us. And that's for later. But I just, again, I want you guys to leave with that thought also. That it's one thing to follow. It's one thing to say, I claim this. I give voice to it. In fact, I, I make sure I do all the right stuff. It is yet another thing to fully submit your entire life to Christ. Anyway, that's for next time. But Jesus' response to Judas and the others present, it reveals some things that's really happening that I never realized until I began to study this as we're all looking at John. I had always been taught it was just kind of a contrast, perhaps between Mary and Martha. Martha's always busy, and Mary is the one who's serving Jesus. Uh, it was a contrast just between the way Judas um, was lying and Mary was giving her best. And I'm not saying that stuff isn't part of it, but I say this, that I've, I've kind of missed this point. Jesus says, and did you get it? If you read it in Matthew, it, it actually it clarifies it. He says, leave her alone. Leave her alone. You're always going to have poor people. You're always going to have them. But I'm not going to be with you much longer, and she's preparing my body for the burial. You see, they had um, rituals that they would prepare a body once it was dead to be entombed. In fact, as you recall, later on, why do these same people go to the tomb that's empty? They're going to the tomb because they knew that men certainly didn't get Jesus' body right after he was dead. And in this situation, he is saying, she is actually preparing me for my burial. Everything Jesus said and did, and we say this every week as we study through the Gospels, and I, I, I can't say it too much, Everything that Jesus said and everything that Jesus did, when you read the scripture, everything he said and did was revealing something about his character and or his purpose for why he came to earth, his vocation. And this one event that we're looking at right now as he's preparing for this week, which would lead him to the cross, I, I could make the case it may be the most rich, the most significant with meaning of any single act we see done by anyone in Scripture outside of Christ. So we're just going to go through it. You see, the name Christ uh, is the title of the one God had promised he would send to deliver Israel. It means the anointed one. It means the Messiah. It's so in this anointing, the, one of the first things we get, and very easy, right? We get pick this up. This anointing reveals Jesus 
as Messiah. But I also want to tell you this. He's not only revealed as the Messiah, but in Israel, how they would coronate their kings involved an anointing of oil over their heads. Some of you are very familiar when King David, as a young man, was anointed by the prophet and the anointing of oil. They would have known this anointing of oil was not just saying he is very clearly the anointed one, the Messiah. It's also saying Jesus as Messiah and Jesus as king. Jesus the Messiah was the king. And I think sometimes we miss that in this little, this little narrative. But John also focuses on what? Poured it over the head, but he focused on what? The feet. He focused on the feet because he's also saying in this, and John, I believe, knows exactly how he's writing about it. When he's looking back and he realizes in the last time they were together and they were at the Passover feast, the way Jesus introduced himself on this last time to his disciples as they came in was by washing their feet. So this king, this Messiah, was actually going to be greatest as a servant. He was a servant king is what John was telling us. Jesus reinforced it at the Last Supper. But I also want you to know this. Again, it was also saying that Jesus was God. Why? Because Mary, again, using of this nard oil that was actually a fragrance that would fill up the temple. John makes his point to say, as this thing was poured over Jesus, as Mary took her hair and she's wiping his feet, this is the fragrance that fills the entire house, just as that fragrance would have filled the temple and the fragrance offering that the priest would give. It's Jesus. It's God. But it's also kind of cool, and this was the one I picked up on more than anything this week. I thought, this is really cool, and I should probably not give it right now. I should do a whole message about it, so we may return to this thing. But it also harkens back to the Song of Solomon. Again, when someone, when a bride had this nard oil, this amazing fragrance, one of the things in the first century they would do would be to give it to who? The bride would give it to their groom. It was his presentation on the, on the wedding bed. It was Solomon's bride, his, his love saying, above everything else, he identified with me because this was the fragrance. And so I want you guys to understand this is very powerful, and I probably don't have the ability to explain it, so I'll just say it the way it came to me. This is foreshadowing this beautiful relationship between us and Jesus. Paul, the Apostle Paul, said that he is the groom and we are the bride. This is this amazing thing that she is giving this worship to him. It's foreshadowing the fact that we have all been invited, that we will be invited in this beautiful, unique relationship as the bride of Christ. The Messiah, I'm just going to kind of recap. And just a little thing. Oh, she wiped his feet, and they said it was worth a lot of money, and it moved on. And this beautiful scene, which is really the last thing that we see before Jesus goes into Jerusalem, he is being anointed before he goes as the Messiah, as the King, as God, and it's foreshadowing this beautiful relationship that he was going to be inviting us into. And he tells us how he's going to pull it off. He's been saying the whole time, and he says it yet again, how is he going to pull this thing off, to reconcile us, his bride, to himself? How is he going to reconcile us when we're just paper, as we've said, to God who is holy, who is fire. How is this event going to happen? And he says, he says, it's going to happen because I'm going to die. He told everyone in that room how this would be accomplished because he told them that Mary was preparing his body, well, for burial in a tomb. And what do we know? We know that the very next day he goes to where a donkey is waiting And he gets on that donkey, and he rides into Jerusalem. And a little historical fact, because I love history. This was significant. Do you know what a king would ride into a town when his intent was to bring war and to conquer it? Do you know what a king would ride? No. No. What would he ride? To bring war. What would he ride? What would you guys picture a king on? Spencer, you love this thing. What? What? When Christ comes back in Revelation, you want to get this weird tattoo. What will he be riding on, Revelation says? A white horse with tattoos, right? He's got it tattooed on his thighs, and he's coming back 
to judge. He's coming back in a way that is different than the way he entered into Jerusalem. In those days, if a king were to go into a city with the intent to bring conquer, to bring war, to bring violence, to bring judgment to them, he would ride a royal steed. If he was coming to bring peace, as Solomon did, he would ride a donkey. Jesus gets on a donkey and heads into Jerusalem the very next day after being anointed by Mary as the Messiah, as the king, who is God himself, who is going to the tomb to invite us into this beautiful relationship. And I'll say again what I, I led with. Last week, we just simply discussed how God can use even those who oppose him. I want you to think about in this story all that she did by simply submitting her best to him. How much more can God use us when we don't hold back, but when we give everything, when we fully submit, like Mary did? See, I, I do, I think all the time that we always have this tendency, especially in this world, to hold back because, again, we fear. We have this as this equation, this equation that if I give everything to you, if I give everything to my bride, if I give everything to my community, if I give everything to my family, we view it as what? I might lose and never get back. And Jesus is time and time again in his ministry said, the Holy Spirit is in such a way entering in his believers, we can never talk to TJ, right? We talked about our job is not to make sure that we keep our cup filled, and it's not our job to make sure we fill anybody else's cup. TJ, what is our job as believers with the cup God has given us? That's it. Our job is to continually pour our cup out, pour it out. Jesus went in on a donkey, and he went to his death in such a way that he said, you have to participate in my sufferings to get the blessings. It's just, it's just this simple. And so I just think in this little thing we've looked at, and we're done for the most part, that I just want us to ask ourselves again, are we more like Judas Am I more like Judas or am I more like Mary? And again, forget all the stuff you thought about Judas and forget all this stuff. Oh, just ask yourself, do you follow Jesus and yet you've never fully submitted to Jesus? It's a simple question. It's one I've had to ask myself and the answer this week is that it was, man, there's things I just, I keep grabbing from them. There's things I've given up, and then when it doesn't work out the way I want, that my preference, my passion, my comfort, it's not happening. I keep wanting to get them back because he's not really doing it the way I want it. That is the essence of the story of Judah, Judas. That he, didn't, he wasn't doing it the way Judas wanted. And so it is a dangerous thing as a believer to follow Jesus without ever fully submitting him. Or, 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 or do we live like Mary? And so I just... I just started to look at some of the things that if we were to look at just this story of Mary, how, how our lives would look. And I'll put it in the form of questions. Does your life declare Jesus as God and King? Your life. Does your life declare that he's both God and King of your life? Even the demons knew who he was and they trembled. But they, man, they didn't submit everything. They didn't follow him and submit to him. It's one thing for us to give verbal acquiescence that, yes, I believe he is Jesus, he is God. It is quite another to submit to him as my king of my life. Does your life reflect king and God? Do you? Do you know what you are? And I've said this in the past. I, I love this. Do we in here, you individually, myself, and again, um, Spencer and I were talking about this last week, and for those of you, there's some new people in here, so let me just kind of tell you what we're about. So it's a family meeting, but you can leave knowing this. I have no demographic I'm speaking to. I, I've decided that as long as we're doing this at life point, whether God keeps us going for a while or shuts this thing down, I'm only going to share the gospel. I'm not trying to um, fix your uh, marital problems. I'm not trying to um, fix your finances. Now, as we talk about those things, the gospel, man, it has a lot of stuff. It's going to help you. You could leave here. And you. Last, first message I gave 25 years ago was you can save your marriage without saving your soul. So I want to tell you guys, man, I, I want you to know that, that you can take the things we say in here. You can apply them, and your life will be better. And you can do so in such a way you still never fully submit your heart to Jesus Christ. Do you understand that? And we've been called to do that in such a way as his citizens of the kingdom of heaven here and now to live our life in such a way that here's what we are. You, if you've accepted Christ, if you've named the name of Jesus Christ, 
is the one upon which you will build your life. You're going to follow him. You're going to make sure everything in your life is ordered, is ordered along that. The Holy Spirit comes inside of us in such a way that just like the temple, you now are the temple. That you, if this is you and me, we are the place where God's space and man's place comes together. We are. We are the walking around temple. When I grew up, I was always thinking you couldn't get a tattoo, you couldn't grow hair, you couldn't drink whiskey because you're the temple. That is not what it meant. That's so cheap. What it really means is this beautiful thing that God's entire purpose was to pursue us, as Spencer said, in such a way that he would have this beautiful connection. And on the day of Pentecost, following what Jesus did on the cross, God reentered his temple. And it's us. Does your life, does my life live in such a way that it gives this fragrance to everybody around me? This sweet, beautiful fragrance that is life? I don't know. I'm working on it. Does your life, and this is, this is big, does your life reflect your role, your relationship with Christ as his bride? And I mean this. Do you, do you realize that we've been called to participate with each other? That we are the bride, we are the body of Christ. D does your relationship with his church, does it reflect that? Do you interact with each other? Do you pray for each other? Do you come alongside? Do you mourn for each other like you were saying? Do you gather together? Uh, it's a big deal for us that we are the bride of Christ. Does our life reflect that thing? And, and the last thing I would simply say is this, and do we live as one prepared to die every day? And by this I mean not physically die, although... I'm not scared of death. I'm, I'm just not really excited about dying, right? But I mean this. Do you put to death every day your desire for your comfort versus those around you? Do you serve people in such a way that you constantly, constantly put to death your selfish desires? Do we live like such a thing? You see, I'll say again, Judas followed Jesus, but he never fully submitted to Jesus. He just kept something back, and it was tragic. You know the end of the story. What he kept back was his agenda, the way he thinks things ought to be, his preference for his comfort. But Mary gave Jesus everything, and she submitted everything. And I'll go back to my original point. She loved Jesus and worshipped him extravagantly. And I think the extravagance of her worship what did it do? Everything she did in her extravagant worship testified to who he was. And it's on your little notebook thing, your, your, your bookmark. Our lives and the way we live them and the way we offer them up every day as a living sacrifice, ordering our lives in such a way that we follow Jesus' commands, living in such a way that the fount of living waters, his Holy Spirit, is in us, and it guides us. We say at life point, it's our three tenets. It's it. We're not going to change them. Love God, love people, walk in the Spirit. There is freedom there. Do you live in such a way? Do you live in such a way that this kind of thing is, is extravagant? Does your life testify to who God is. When people see you, do they say things like this? Um, yeah, no, um, I'm not much of a churchgoer, but man, that guy loves Jesus. That lady, she, is, she lives for Christ. That person over there, do you live in such a way that your community identifies you are sold out, you are all in? I said a couple weeks ago, we're so worried about being weird, most of us don't even look different. And I think it's time we should. I think we've been called to do so. I know I have. And, and the extravagance of Mary's worship, well, it testified to who he was. And this one act of worship and was so pure, was so beautiful, that we had to talk about it today because Jesus commanded it. I want you to put up Matthew 26, 13. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her, and you don't see that anywhere else. Mary, giving her best, submitting to him in every way that her entire action said, he is the Messiah, he is the king, he is God, and I am in this relationship with him that will be, it is unique, and I will give everything to it. In such a way that Jesus said to everybody in that room, he said, you know what? Because of what she did, man, everywhere they preached the gospel, 
they're going to talk about it. And that's what we did today because, well, we were kind of commanded to, weren't we? So that's it. We're just going through this thing. We're going through the book of John. And all I have, and this is kind of my, my last thing for those of you, um, this is just me. This is what I learned this week. That's all. This is all I got. I live my life in such a way that on my good days, I submit everything. I'm just being honest. That on my good days, when I see somebody, I just approach them. On my good days, I give them, um, I, I give my money up. And on my good days, I, I make time for things. And, and on my bad days, I attempt to take them back. On my good days, when I'm with the people I prefer and who agree with me, this constant line of communication makes me feel wonderful, makes me feel great. On my bad days, I'm like, oh, man, I, I can't, I hate that guy. Oh, I'm not supposed to, you've never said that, right? I can't stand that person. I, I really, I, that guy needs to be punched in the throat. Now, listen, I'm not saying some people don't need to be punched in the throat. Barry, can you edit that out? I'm not saying some people don't need to be righteously punched in the throat. But I am saying it reaches my heart. What about you guys? How many times in the course of your week does it just get in your heart and you're like, I just want, I want what I want today. And I'm thinking, I, man, I am, such, I am such a better husband. I am such a better father. I'm a better friend and I'm a better pastor when I submit everything to Jesus Christ. In that moment that it comes and I try to take it back, I'm, I'm so mad. I try to stop myself and go, okay, this is what I was talking about with you, Jesus. This is just what I talked about. I can't stand that guy. And he's like, why do you think I brought him to you today? What? Because everything he uses for his glory and the most glorious thing he has ever done in my life was transform me, a very selfish, bitter, angry, rage-filled individual into someone who desires to love him deeply, to love you guys deeply, and to move in the freedom that the Spirit offers. So every time he gives me a chance to remember that, it is a beautiful thing. And so I would ask you guys today, in this story, with Mary's actions being such that Jesus himself said, everywhere they say about me, they're going to talk about her. Isn't that crazy? That is crazy. Yeah. In that, do we resemble her or do we resemble the one going, that was a stupid thing you did. That was $31,000. I think that we should love extravagantly. I think the Christian walk, we should worship extravagantly. I think people who see us say, you forgive extravagantly. You're weird. You worship. You live. You love. You do things in such a way. I just don't get it. So much so, can I be a part of it? That's what we've been called to do. Let's pray.